the barn. It was a close, muggy day without a breeze. The sound of blues guitar came from the house, but no sound as yet from the women's barn. The guitar repeating a riff, tentatively at first, but with growing confidence, adding new chords and progressions as the day wore on. George paced the yard, feeling a general lack of use. Some of the black guys, who had experience of these things, tried to console him, inviting him to jam with them, and George told himself he'd done his deed. But his mind was not on music. He'd met Maisie, Mary Joseph, in Richmond, two years before in 1922. Maisie was a chambermaid, and George had just been evicted from the barn he'd been sleeping in and had no home. They'd met in the park. She had been enjoying her Sunday leisure, and they'd hit it off straight away, because they were each, in their own way, outsiders. Her mother was not respectable, and George had yet to shake off his German accent. George had only been an American for less than two years then. He had emigrated with his family, Heinrich his father, his three sisters and baby brother, queuing up at Ellis Island, clutching their Swedish passports and playing down their German connections. That was in 1920, and George was especially keen to play down his service in the Navy. They'd settled in New York for a while, in a tiny run-down tenement, fifth-story room on 15th Street in Queens. They'd soon moved south by train to Richmond, Virginia, where they had folk in the German community there. It helped that they were musical, that America was enjoying an unprecedented boom. Heinrich had settled in Richmond, and George would happily have stayed, but Maisie wanted out of the town of her birth. It was not just her mother who'd been a whore, her grandmother had been a prostitute, also, and it was a fate Maisie was eager to avoid. Instead, she sought to emulate her great-grandmother, Martha Joseph, who had been a pioneer on the opening of the Oregon Trail, and someone in whom Maisie took great pride. Martha was her guiding hope. So George and Maisie struck up together. They'd hitchhiked out of town. It had taken them two days, and they'd fetched up in Nashville. There they'd fallen in with a community of black musicians that occupied the old farm. The little community consisted of four couples, all of them musicians and singers of the blues, and they played the guitar, trumpet and trombone. And at that time George and Maisie were the only whites amongst them, George played the French horn, and Maisie could sing a bit. Amongst his many accomplishments, George was a certified music teacher. Heinrich had insisted that George gain such a qualification when they still lived in Sweden. He tutored George himself. As far as anyone knew, the farmstead had no owner, and so they had squatted it. It was 1924, and they had been there for five years already. And, as it turned out, they would have another 11 years before the rightful owners turned up and kicked them out. It was night, and the thunderstorm air had still not cleared. The trees boomed with deafening chicadas, but there was to be no storm, and the lights burned from the house. A dimmer, flickering light came from the big barn. Then the birth cry came. A rush of thoughts came to George's mind. Was Maisie okay? Had she survived the birth? Had anything happened? Was the baby alive and well? Then more introspective thoughts. He was no longer young. George was 34, but he never felt like it. Now he was being replaced, his vigour replaced by responsibility. He no longer answered to the roll call of youth. This child, especially if it was a boy, would, in time, replace him. Would he despise the old man George would inevitably become? Was he up to the new challenge? Then from the barn's entrance, a woman beckons, sweat glistening on her black brow. It was Molly McCarthy, acting midwife of the group. George followed on meekly. And there was Maisie, exhausted, clutching a blood-stained child, glowing with maternal pride. A baby. There was blood in the candle and lamplight. It's a boy, she said, gazing on the little life. We'll call him George. It was what they had agreed.